Yeah. I want to thank Papa EJ for that this morning. That was powerful and really, really ministers to my heart. The battle is fierce and it's more fierce if you feel like you're alone and it's good to know that we're not alone. Yeah. We're together in all of this. That's right. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this. It really is amazing how God just stitches everything together and sometimes you you feel like going a direction and you're like, ah, I just don't know. And then God comes in and reassures you, yeah, that's the direction I want you to go. And so then you go there and then you see how he's planned everything out. And it's really amazing to watch Daddy take care of stuff like that. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9 it's interesting that this was the verse I had actually put this verse down last night and then I get into my U version app this morning and I'm just and this is the verse for the day and so it's it's kind of interesting that it shows up. It's one of my life verses, and it's, it's probably, I would say, uh, the most impactful verse that's been over my life. Um, as I think about life verses, I have a few, and, and we'll actually be looking at three of them today as we go through our message. But Joshua 1.9 says, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We're, we're looking in the issue of spiritual warfare, and if you were here Wednesday night, uh, we, we brought out a map of Rollins, and we started circling strongholds in our community. And if you're interested, that map is downstairs in the fellowship hall. It's hanging up on the wall. You can go see it. You can see the marks. You can see the locations. Um, they'll probably be noticeable to you, recognizable to you. There's a lot of stuff in our community that is going on. We talked a lot Wednesday night about how do we really impact our community. And, um, you know, there's an area where having, having community functions is good. Uh, but there's an area where you have to step back and you have to say, what is really the impact that we're having? What is really the purpose? You know, are we doing community functions for the sake of community functions? Some people do community functions for the sake of growing their church. Period. That's it. Are we trying to grow the church or are we trying to impact our community? Are we, are we looking for more butts in the seats or are we looking for transformed hearts and lives? Come on. See, if it's a transformed heart and life, it, it doesn't matter where they go to church. If, they, if they're hearing the word, if it's, you know, I look back on my life and there's multiple churches of multiple flavors that I have been a part of in my journey. And there's multiple speakers that I have attached to in my journey of different flavors. And even now, I still find myself finding new flavors. I like flavors. I'm a, I like to cook, I like good food, and, and spiritually, I like good food as well. And so, I'm always on the lookout for that voice. I don't just tell myself, well, I don't know them, so I'm not gonna listen to them. No, I listen to them and it's like, eh. And then sometimes you run across one and you're like, wow, this guy is amazing. And I didn't even know who he was. And, and really, outside of his little sphere of influence and his little world, nobody else knows who he is. And, and, but, but to listen and, and to hear the truth of the Word of God and to see how it fits and how it works in your journey. And, 
And that's really, you know, an area that we have to understand if we're talking community transformation, if we're talking transformed hearts, transformed lives, you know, our intent is to bring the kingdom of God into Rollins, Wyoming. Amen. That's our intent, is to expand the kingdom of God in this community, in this town, and to, to really function effectively in the kingdom of God here in this church. And we have to understand some things in order to do that. We have to know kingdom culture. We have to kind of get a grip on how different it is from our Western culture and Western civilization. And we have to understand the basic strategies and, and application for spiritual warfare because we can look into this town, into our community, and, and we ask the question, God, why is harvest time here? And, and there's a place where we... We, we are a prison ministry and we minister to those in prison. But there's a broader application in that. It's, it's not simply just going to the physical location where men and women are behind bars and ministering freedom to them. It's about all who are in a prison who find themselves locked in chains, who find themselves locked in a cell that they can't get out of, and we, we minister to them as well. Because there's a place where the kingdom of God, the purpose of the kingdom of God is to set people free. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. To what? To bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. free. To set the captives free. And it's not just those who are quote unquote unsaved. It's every captive yep. needs to be set free. That's right. And there are people who would align themselves as children of God. Whether that's, that's a reality or not. That's up to God to judge. But there, but, but there are people who sit in church on a regular basis, who read their Bibles even on a regular basis, who maybe even pray on a regular basis, and they're still bound up in captivity. Yep. They have not realized the truth of that song we sing today, which is from the scripture that who the sun sets free is free indeed. Yeah, it's good. You can say it. You can read it. But is it true in your life? I mean, really true. Not just, well, I, I'm going to say it's true and still be in chains. Okay, that's good. Don't stop saying it's true because eventually, hopefully, prayerfully, Holy Spirit will take that word that you keep repeating and, and take it from here and move it into your heart and it'll become a realized truth. But is it actually a realized truth in your life that you are walking free? And as we move into this time in which we live, this verse, Joshua 1.9, becomes vitally important for all of us to, to grasp hold of and understand. And there's a place where we see the realities of what is taking place around us. And in the midst of those realities, we do not fear. Yes. And in the midst of those realities, we assure ourselves that the Lord is with us. Yes. That God is with us. Yeah. He is with us. Amen. One of the first keys to wage spiritual warfare effectively is to have a true revelation, knowledge, understanding that God is with us. Yeah. Because if you don't have that, you're not going to go into a battle with confidence. That's right. And you're going to lose. <laughs> Plain and simple. You have to know that God is with you. That I'm a child of God means more than just than just someday I get to run up and hug daddy. It means that he's actually with me. 
that he actually accepts me for who I am, for he knows who I am. He accepts me for the personality that I have, but it's in the, in the desire to transform me into who he actually created me to be. And through the whole process, there has been acceptance. And that if, if I come into a battle... I have to first and foremost know and understand and know in my in the, the my heart of heart that God's actually with me. He's actually here yeah. with me in this battle. He's empowering me to fight this battle. Yeah. Another life verse that I have adopted just recently. And I've only adopted it recently, not because it's, not because I thought to myself, well, that's a really cool verse. I'd like to have that as a life verse. But I adopted it recently because it actually was something that God was trying to show me for my, sometimes we're really slow. He was trying to show me for my whole life that this was one of his words to me, and I didn't catch it until the last few years, Jeremiah 33, 3, and this is vital as we move into any battle, as we function within our community, as we try to figure out what God wants us to do as a church, as harvest time, as we try to figure out our intent and purpose, Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Wow. Do you, do you realize what, what God just said? I mean, we, we look at, right, there's, there's a verse that says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally, right? And without holding back, but, but, but we don't really even sometimes get that. that. That just becomes a Christian cliche, right? Well, I don't know what to do in this situation. Well, if anybody likes wisdom, let them ask of God. There you go, brother. There's your verse. But to, to really understand that God actually would have you call to him, because he actually wants to answer you. That, that he would actually want you to ask him to give you revelation and understanding. Understanding is wisdom. Okay? Revelation is like knowledge. It's like you finally get it. But then wisdom is how you apply what you finally just got. So God wants to give you revelation and understanding. He wants to give you knowledge. He wants to give you the ability to, to implement these things. There, there are hidden things that you do not know. You realize that. When it comes to Harvest Time Ministries, there are hidden things we do not know. When it comes to Rollins, Wyoming, there are hidden things we do not know. Things that have transpired in the spiritual realm that we have no clue about. There are heart conditions and motivations of individuals who are functioning in high levels of authority within the community that we know nothing about. There are hidden things that we don't know. And how do we impact our community? How do we move effectively in our lives? How do we fight spiritual battles? Just on the personal level, how do I effectively wage war in the battle that has come against me personally? There are hidden truths that God wants to reveal to us. Yeah. To win the battle. Yeah. To win the battle. Yeah. Make it obvious. Yeah. If we go back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, where we started this 
series. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. I want to focus a little bit more in on the last statement of that verse. For they love not their lives even unto death. What does that really mean? What does that really mean? Why? Last message we talked about the seeds that were sown. Do you remember what the definition of the seeds that were sown and the weeds grew up with them and choked them out? Do you remember what, what that meant? It was the seeds that were sown and they took root, but then the, the weeds were actually the cares of the world that came in. And choked out the seed, ch choked out the plant. The cares of the world is everything in the flesh. It's everything in this physical manifest presence in which we live. It's your bank account, or the lack thereof. <laughs> it's the things that you see in life relationships, those are wrapped up in the cares of this world. It's the house in which you live. It's the car that you drive. It's your current health condition. All of these things are wrapped up in the cares of the world. Your success, your standing, your... All of it. And, and, and the word of the kingdom, this is what the parable was saying, is that the word of the kingdom comes to you and you receive it and it's planted and it takes root and it starts to grow, but then you start to shift focus from the word that you were given or from the word that you received into the reality, the manifest reality of your current circumstances and the manifest reality of your current circumstances doesn't look like the word you receive. And it becomes a care of this world that you now are moving in flesh mode or in the natural mind trying to figure out how you're going to overcome these problems, these circumstances, these situations. How you're going to get more money, how you're going to get a better house, how you're going to get a better name, how you're going to get all this stuff. And next thing you know, the word has been choked out. That word which directly relates to your destiny, to your purpose, to your position in the kingdom of God. That word that was positioning you for advancement in the kingdom of God. That word then gets choked out because of everything going on around you. And we shared Wednesday night that one of the things that the enemy has actually been unfortunately, fairly successful at it, and this goes for me too, so don't feel like I'm preaching at anybody. But one of the things the enemy has been very successful at in our congregation is isolating us and separating us and then surrounding us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Divine yeah. And we've been fighting the cares of this world that the enemy keeps impacting and we have long forgotten the word of the kingdom that once held us strong, united, arm in arm, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, yeah. sword to sword and shield to shield. Yeah. One man wasn't meant to fight a war. You know how many, how many men, how much manpower, how much resources were pumped into World War I, World War II? They didn't just send one guy, okay, go fight this war. They sent an army. They sent the Navy, 
They sent the Marines. They sent the Air Force. The Air Force. They sent everybody. And they drafted people who weren't actually in the Army, Air Force, Navy, or Marines. Why? Because we need more manpower. We need all hands on deck. And after we count all hands on deck, guess what? We're pulling from the regulars to put them into military service. Man, yes. There, there comes wars and battles that are so serious that you don't just throw just enough at it to try and hope that you get it and that they don't overpower you. Yes. You throw everything you have at it. Yes. And that means the regulars who are sitting at home in the comfort of their couches watching TV, it's time to go to war. Yes. Amen. Woo! Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Everybody. Everybody. Now has a part to play. Because this is the most serious thing that is going on in the moment. There is no time. There is no room for you to sit back and, and watch everybody else fight and sacrifice and give their lives. And you sit home and do nothing and hope that they win the day. It's time to get up. It's time to fight the fight. We have been separated. We have been isolated. The enemy has found a way to get us so surrounded with the cares of this world that every day feels like an emergency. Right? Every day you wake up and it feels like you're in an emergency. You're in emergency mode. And dear Lord, just help me survive the day. And everybody in the congregation is praying, dear Lord, help me survive the day as I fight my own battles and nobody is fighting the war. That's right. Good word. This means I don't care what happens to me. I'm going to stand with my brother and sister today. Yeah. I don't care the attacks that are going on in my life. I'm going to stand with them today. Yeah. We're coming together today. Together. We talk about the issue of corporate prayer. We talk about why do we come here in the mornings for corporate prayer. It is the moment in time in our lives, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., one hour, three days a week, we could say, I don't care about the emergencies in my life. I am coming together with my brothers and sisters in a united heart and a united purpose yes. because there's a war that's greater than the battle and I need to get into the war. Yes. Amen. Woo. Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Ephesians chapter 6. Wednesday, I threw out some verses, spiritual warfare verses. We didn't really have time to dig into them much. So I want to dig in a little bit today. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. And this is one we're very familiar with and we know. But I just want to highlight some things in here that uh, I think maybe we just need to hear today. Starting in verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert. Heard that word today. Keep alert 
with all perseverance. Be the watchman. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. For all the saints. Not, for, not just for you and yours. For all the saints. For the army. For the army. For all the saints. Making supplication. To go back to Romans chapter or Revelation chapter 12, if we were to read through all of that. You see, when there was this, this confrontation in the heavenlies, and God and the armies of God cast the serpent down, the, the dragon down to the earth. The very next thing it says is, Woe to the earth, for the dragon has been cast down. And he knows that his time is short. And he is going to wreak havoc on the earth because he knows his time is short. If you wake up in the morning and you feel it's emergency mode and you feel... Dear God, I just need a way to survive the day. Is it possible that there are many others going through the same thing? Yeah. And again, where is our strength? This is my battle. It's all me. I got to fight it on my own. I guess I just have to win or lose, live or die. Here it is. Me and a legion of demons. Let's go. Or maybe it's a call to arms. Brothers, sisters, Fellow warriors, I have this going on today. Awesome. We will join you in battle. And guess what? While we're joining you in battle, you can join us in battle because we have this going on today. And we have this, look, at, at this flank, the enemy is charging this flank. And the enemy is charging this flank. And I see the enemy behind us. And I see the enemy right in front of us. And they're trying to draw us out. And they're trying to draw us out. And there's so many things going on in our personal lives. Listen, it's only an attempt to draw you out of rank. To get you out of rank. You hear the screams in all the war movies. Hold your positions. Hold your positions. Stand firm in the evil day. And having done all, stand therefore. Hold your position. Hold the line. Don't lose the line. Why? Right. Because the safety is in the position. That's right. If they can get you singled out and separated, victory is theirs, not yours. You have to hold the line. Perseverance, supplication for all the saints. That's how you hold the line. That's how you hold the line. You say, yeah, this is an attack on me, but it's bigger than me. And I don't care what attacks come at, my, at me this day. I will not step out of line. I will not step out of rank. I will not lose the position. I will not cause a falter in the ranks because I stepped out of my position. You have to hold the line. And also for me, Paul says, pray for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul, I mean, think about that, Paul. Paul, Paul feels a need for prayer support, for boldness. 
Who, who would think that Paul needs boldness, right? You wouldn't think that. But when you go back and you read 2 Corinthians, and you start reading through there, Paul starts talking about, about how this thing played out in his life. He said, look, in letters, I am extremely bold with you. But in person, it's almost like he was saying he was kind of sheepish. He was kind of reserved and held back in person. He has great boldness in the letter, right? How many of you guys know those people? <laughs> I gave you a piece of my mind. Yeah. <laughs> And you go up and talk to him, hey man, what was that all about? <laughs> oh, I got a spirit of Paul on you, right? You're bold in letter, but not in person. <laughs> but he's asking for boldness. You realize that, that boldness goes beyond just being able to, to speak your mind, yes. okay? Sometimes that doesn't, that's not actually boldness. Sometimes that can be stupidity. <laughs> <coughs> boldness is about facing the battle with courage. Boldness is about not turning and looking back once your hand is to the plow. Boldness is about seeking out help and strength from others when you're not. Boldness is about the, the effectual proclamation of truth in a, in a culture that is built on lies. Yeah. <clears throat> it's boldness. Boldness is not about tearing people down. Boldness is just about speaking truth. I need boldness so that I don't walk away from the battle. Boldness so I keep pressing in. I wonder at times how often Paul, in the midst of his hardship, would look back in his life at the day when he stood holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. And he looked at the boldness of Stephen in that moment. And that that actually gave him boldness to give his life. That the person that you would oversee the murder of would actually speak a resonating sound in your heart for the rest of your life. And then knowing that, you still push forward. You still go. Yes, I persecuted the church. Yes, I killed people in the church. I took part of that. I saw them die. I saw them breathe their last breath as I sat there with a grin on my face. And I saw them look up to heaven and say, Father, do not charge the sin to their account. God, give me that kind of boldness that I could become like Stephen in that moment. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Starting in verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, 
but have divine power to destroying strongholds. We destroy argument and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. I think do we have the next one? Yeah. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. In Ephesians chapter 6, it said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness of this world. And, and here we see Paul saying that our weapons are not weapons of flesh, but they're mighty, right? Again, we, we come back to the issue of the cares of this world because, because we've all been wrapped up in the cares of this world. And Paul, Paul spends a lot of time distinguishing the difference between the flesh and, and how we're actually going to fight the spiritual battles, how we actually wage effective war. See, the problem is when we get wrapped up with the cares of this world, then we try out of our mind to figure out the solution. We turn to natural things. We turn to natural solutions. Well, if I do this, then maybe they'll do this. Or if I do this, it'll fix this. Or if I can do this, then this will happen and, and everything will turn for my good. If, if maybe if I don't do this, or, or if I, you know, our, our mind goes into problem-solving mode. And, and being a good problem-solver is good. It really is. Not knocking that. Don't lose that ability if you have that ability. But understand that that can limit you in the area of fighting a spiritual battle. Because you're going to be focused on how do I solve this problem in the natural when the answer is not a natural answer. The answer is a spiritual answer. This is a spiritual issue. This is a spiritual problem. This is part of what we have been talking about, what we set the stage with this series on the issue of the root. The issue of the root is that it's a spiritual problem. It's not going to be solved by natural means. You can't just will yourself to not do this anymore. This has to be taken care of on a spiritual level. That's the only way it gets solved. The only way you can fight the battles is on a spiritual level. You have to overcome the flesh. You have to overcome the flesh. And overcoming the flesh is not just grinning, gritting and baring your teeth until somehow you gain the ability to not do what you really, 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 really want to do. Overcoming the flesh is killing and crucifying the very desire to do what you really, 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 really want to do. Romans chapter 12. Actually, 2 Corinthians, I think, is the next one. 2 Corinthians 5.16, I told you on. Be careful, because I might have these out of order. 2 Corinthians 5.16. says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though once we regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. The cross and the resurrection are in the narrative for a reason. And we, we look at the cross and the resurrection and, and we, we say rightfully, truthfully, that the cross is where the Savior died and the resurrection is where he rose again in newness of life, which thereby uh, sealed forever the ability for all of those uh, who were not in relationship with God, to come into relationship with God and move into the family of God and have an eternity in heaven. And that's right and that's true. Um, but but it, it speaks more than that. The cross actually 
has and should have power in our lives now. And, and by having power in your life, I don't just simply mean the power to get you a ticket to heaven for all eternity. The reality of the cross and the power of the cross is that it is the instrument to destroy the flesh. It was the instrument that was used to put to death the flesh. And the flesh of Jesus hung on the cross and died. The flesh of Jesus was put to death. If we understood the power of the cross, we would take our flesh to the cross and allow the cross to put our flesh to death. Because as long as we're holding on to the flesh, and as long as our, we have failed to submit our flesh to the death of the cross, then we're, we're, we always have a tag in the fleshly realm that interrupts our ability to effectively engage in spiritual warfare. There will always be you're ready to swing and you uh, right and something pulls you back. Man, I was that close. I, hmm, almost decapitated that dude, right? But at the last minute I got pulled back. What was that? That was your flesh. You almost had victory. But your flesh got in the way. We can't, we can't fight spiritual battles from the flesh. Amen. And we won't effectively fight spiritual battles if we're hanging on to things in the flesh. That's right. There's an issue of open doors and open sores. Wounds that we haven't been healed from and doors that haven't been shut in our lives. Yes. Doors that were open. Now, is it, it's bad for there to be open doors, right? Not a trick question. It's bad, okay? But sometimes we, we have the ability to major in really causing more wounds in people's lives because of the doors that they open. Let me ask you a question. If I'm sitting in my house and my door's open, it's a hot summer night, door's open. And some crazy guy off the street runs into my house, holds me at gunpoint, and steals everything in my home, and then runs out. Now, this is a real natural thing that happened, okay? Pretend this really happened. And I come to you and I say, man, I don't know what just happened. I, I, I had the door open in my house and this guy just ran in, held me at gunpoint, and then stole everything in my house. Is your response going to be, guess you shouldn't have opened the door. It's your fault you opened the door. Okay, there is a level of truth to that, right? I mean, honestly, there's a level of truth to that. He probably wouldn't have rushed in my house if the door wasn't open. <laughs> but is it any less of, a, of an attack by the enemy just because the door was open? No. It's still an attack from the enemy. He just found an easier way into the house that he wouldn't have found had the door been closed. So when people get attacked because there's been open doors in their lives and the Christian comes in and says, well, serves you right. I guess you shouldn't have had an open door in your life. Really? How about you help them shut the door? Amen. See, this is part of our isolation issue. 
We get isolated and we don't want to go to people. Why? Because I get beat up for the open doors in my life. Rather than showing me how to shut a door, you yell at me for having an open door to begin with. The reality is that open door probably wasn't open until early on in my life and had nothing to do with the door that I opened since I knew the Lord. I just never figured out how to shut the stupid door. Are we so powerless in our Christianity that we look to see the vengeance of God as a reality for his existence rather than the power to heal? Can we come in and shut the doors? Help each other shut the doors. Man, brother, I am so sorry this happened to you. Yes, I will pray for you. I do want you to know because God is showing you there's an open door in your life in this area. But I'm here today to help you shut that door. I can help you with that. Let's pray about that. Let's get before the Father. Let's ask, go back to Jeremiah 33.3. Let's ask about the hidden things. And let's have the Father reveal the hidden things so that we can deal with the things that we do not know of right now. Let me help you shut the door. Because I believe his power to heal is greater than the door that you opened in your life. And it's greater than the enemy that walked in through that open door. The enemy may have had access into your life through that open door. But today we're going to shut the door and there's going to be no more access. Can we come together and start fighting together? Can we work together? How do we tell the truth in love? Is it truth that there was an open door? Yes. Is it truth and love to say you deserve it because you opened the door? No. Or does truth and love say, I'm here to help you figure out what door that was that was open in your life so we can shut it so the enemy no longer has access into your yes. life through that door? Woo. Let me help you. Let's pray about it. Would you trust me enough with this issue of your open door? to where we can really seal that thing up today. Can I help you through it? Because otherwise you're just going to keep fighting it alone. You realize that. You're going to stay isolated. And the enemy's going to keep dragging you down that road. Why? Because it's an open door. He's going to keep coming into the house. The enemy doesn't play by our rules. He's ruthless. He don't care. If he found an open door, he's going to take full advantage of it. He's going to come in faster than you can blink. And he will keep coming in and coming in and coming in. And you may beat him at the moment of interaction, at the moment of engagement. But he will always keep coming in through that open door. Why? Because it's easy access. So let's deal with the open doors. Let's get them closed. How do we get them closed? The power of the cross. The power of the cross to kill the flesh. The power of the cross to kill the flesh, to destroy the flesh, so that the doors get closed. And then what do we do from there? Do we just stay there? No, because it didn't stop there with the story of Jesus. It moved on the power of his resurrection. Paul says that I may know him, the fellowship of his suffering. We don't like that part. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering was his path to the destruction of the flesh. But then the power of his resurrection. What is the power of his resurrection? What does that really mean? Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he hath loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The power of his resurrection. Do you realize what the power of his resurrection was in your life? 
the power of his resurrection in your life, after the flesh was put to death, is to transport you to a position of spiritual authority, of spiritual empowerment. Your ability to fight the spiritual battles is directly related to your position in heavenly places. Your inability to fight spiritual battles is directly related to your inability to overcome the flesh. But your ability to fight spiritual battles is directly related to your position in heavenly places. You're seated with him in heavenly places, spiritually. Spiritually. You're there. You're next to him. You have access to the throne of God. You have the ability to come into the throne room. To stand before God, the Almighty. The judge of the world. And Jesus sitting there, ever interceding on your behalf. Wow. Thank you, God, because I need that. He intercedes on your behalf. And you can fight those battles because of your position. I am a child of God. I am, I am a soldier in the army of God. I come from the throne room of heaven. Yes. I come with the judgments of God. I come, and that's not just bad, right? We get so, we get so, again, we get so focused on God pouring out his wrath that we don't understand that what God initially did was pour out his love. That he loved us so much. That he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. It is for love's sake that he gave his son. It's for truth's sake that he has to pour out his wrath. And for love. And the wrath of God is actually the love of God. But how many people, we've just, we've been like John. And Peter. And not in the good way of John and Peter, right? Oh, Lord, you want us to call fire down from heaven? Come on, Lord, just let us, I'm going to just burn it up, God. Just seriously, destroy the whole thing, wipe it out. There's this house in Washington. <laughs> just, I mean, if you could just burn the, Right? And we just pray, God, will you just want us to call down fire from heaven? And he's like, no, that's not what we're... Uh. Ambassadors of the kingdom of God to advance the kingdom of God. His heart is for those to come into the kingdom. Amen. He, he's going to deal with the evil. And we wage the spiritual battles. And we understand that it's not the flesh and blood. When I pray against the moves that the president is making, you have to pray correctly. There's a place where God opens invitation to a president to come into the kingdom. You know that. Mm -hmm. Now whether you want them there or not. But you know the invitation exists. And you know that it's not an issue of flesh and blood, right? It is a spiritual attempt by darkness to completely overthrow this nation and to destroy this nation. Because of the way this nation was created, 
And because of the original intent and purpose that God had for America, darkness is seriously trying to disrupt that and destroy that. America has been a beacon of light for way too long as far as the enemy is concerned. Succeeded way too long as far as the enemy is concerned. Been under the blessing of God far too long as far as the enemy is concerned. The attempt by the darkness is to destroy this nation. This is a spiritual battle. This is not a battle of flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. You're not going to fight it with weapons of flesh and blood. It's only going to be effectively fought spiritually. How can we fight that spiritually? Again, it's this whole message. We have to come to the place where we come back into our line of formation as the body of Christ. And you say, well, we're just one church in one small town in one small part of the entire nation. But what happens if we never come back into our position in rank because we feel like it's pointless for us to come back into our position in rank? And what if the next church feels the same way and the next church and the next church, and next thing you know, you have the same thing happening all over the nation that's been happening even just amongst ourselves within our congregation. All of the churches are separated. All of the churches are in emergency mode. They're all just fighting to survive, and none of them are fighting under the common call of the kingdom of God. Yep. So we come back into position come back into position. We say, you know what? Our battles are fierce. Harvest times battles are fierce. Fierce. On an individual level, that means that we as individuals have to, at some point, say, in spite of the fact that my battle is fierce, I'm going to come into alignment with harvest time corporately come back into rank, back into position, back into the battle, and we're going to fight corporately to push forward and to win the day as Harvest Time Ministries. In spite of the fact that I still have battles raging on my own. That also means that as a church, we have to say, yes, Harvest Time's battles are fierce, but there's a war over this nation that is going on. And so we are going to come back into our position and rank in the military of God. And we are going to flood this nation with our prayers, with our intercession, with our alignment with the kingdom of God. And we're going to take a little bit of time out of harvest times battles to focus on the national battles that are waging around us. And as we make those stair steps, we make progression. Now we can fight effectively. God is not calling harvest time to win the national battle. But he's calling harvest time to be a part of the national battle. To stand in our position. To stand in our rank. This was, this was part of the process. The whole revelation that came years and years ago about not, about not being distracted from, from your calling or from your purpose. Why do you think that was such a big revelation? Because you've got to stay in rank. You've got to stay in position. God's the one who designed you to be in a certain place, doing a certain thing for the effectual uh, advancement of the kingdom of God. And if you get distracted or you pick up a calling that's not yours and you start chasing callings and you don't stay true to the calling that God has placed on you as a congregation, then you're stepping out of rank and you're stepping out of position out of the military line that he created. It's his line. It's not yours. You don't get to pick and choose, right? You're in the military. Did you get to pick and choose? No. no. I was in boot camp. I didn't get to pick and choose nothing. We need a volunteer. Rick, thank you for volunteering. I didn't say anything. <laughs> no, you're going to be here. Drill instructor, I know that's what you want me to do. I'm just not feeling it today. 
I, I don't want to. I don't want to carry the colors today. I don't want to be back there. Put me kind of in the middle of the pack today, okay? Just let somebody else carry the colors today, okay? You get tore up, man. You don't tell the drill instructor where you get to be in the position of, of the rank. You don't get to decide that. He decides that. God decides. God decides. And God has called you here for a purpose. He has decided, this is your position in the battle. This is your position in the front line, in the line, wherever we find ourselves placed in the battle, this is where you belong. I am putting you here. But God, I don't want to. I don't care if you don't want to. This is where you're going. You ever said that to your kids? If not, you should sometimes. I don't care what you want. This is what I said. That was free parenting advice, by the way. No charge. So how do we how do we change our community? How do we impact it? How do we do forget those words? How do we do what harvest time was originally instituted in this community to do? Get off the couch and get into the battle. This is serious time. This is serious time. We had our time that we could sit in our couch, eat potato chips. I still do that. It's <laughs> when life wasn't serious, when things weren't serious, we had our time. And, and probably, truth be told, if more believers didn't take such a big break during those times, we probably wouldn't be where we are now. I don't know. May or may not. Regardless, though, now is the time to get involved. Okay. It's draft season, yes. and I'm not talking about <coughs> It's time for everybody to become engaged. Yes. You say, well, my battles are, you know what? As you draw in, yeah. as you come in, you will find more strategy, more ability, and more strength to fight your personal battles mm -hmm. as you come in to fight the corporate ones. Right. It's time to get busy. It's time to get serious. It's time to take the cares of this world, hang them on the cross, and it's time to experience the power of his resurrection, which has seated us in heavenly places and given us the authority to walk in spiritual strength in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation. And in doing so, we will fulfill the intended purpose of harvest time in this so, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for everything that you are doing in and through us, Lord. Lord, as we look out into our purpose, I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to become extremely intentional and engaged during this time. Lord, that you would find us faithful. Lord, that if, that if you chose to not delay your coming, that you would find us faithful. That our lamps would be trimmed full of oil. God, that we would be standing in unity and in oneness. That our hearts would be stitched together. That we would be fighting the battles from the position of the overcomer yes. instead of from the position of the survivor. God, that you would instill in each and every one of us today a greater purpose, a greater understanding of purpose. God, I pray 
Jeremiah 33, 3 over all of us today, Lord, that you are waiting for us to call out so that you can answer to us and that you can reveal to us the hidden things that we do not know. There is so much that we need knowledge of, Lord, so much that we need to be made aware of. Lord, I pray for the revealing of those hidden things. That we would have greater spiritual strategies. That we would see the battle plans. And that we would be able to do our part in standing in our position that you've placed us in. I thank you so much for every person here, Lord. They are extremely, extremely strong warriors, Lord. We've walked through a season where we've been isolated and we've been separated. Lord, we come back together today. Today we declare that Harvest Time Ministries will no longer stand individually separated, removed from the strength of numbers. But Lord, we declare that today we stand together, shoulder to shoulder, sword to sword, and shield to shield. Minister to the hearts of the people today, Lord. Show us how to go out and impact our community this week. Pray this in Jesus' name.